Hello and welcome to the Tech and Sports Podcast. Tech and Sports is a show about how technology is revolutionizing all of the major sports as well as health and fitness. You can find it on your podcast service of choice. My name is Alex Radu and I'm here with the one and only Mandy Kovacs. Hello everyone. This week we discuss whether or not sports leagues have the right to player technology and the ethics around it, plus all the biggest news from the last week, new apps or wearables, and your weekly concussion update. But before we get to that, we would really appreciate it if you would review and rate the Tekken Sports Podcast on iTunes and Google Play or wherever else you get your podcasts from. It really does help us grow the show, and we really, really appreciate all the support so far. And with that, sit back and relax, because the Tekken Sports crew is entering the game. Mandy, this is the news. All right, so first up is news that the NHL is getting ready to implement smart pucks into games for the 2019 season. So these pucks will apparently have advanced data tracking technology embedded into them that will allow the league to track its movement on the ice at a rate of roughly 200 times per second. So the plan is to use the data collected to enhance broadcast and fan experience. It'll also be an analytical tool for teams, including on the bench during games. Uh, So this will most likely be introduced and tested in 2019, either during next year's playoffs or the start of the 2019-2020 season. Uh, And if you remember, the league tested out player tracking technology during the 2016 World Cup of Hockey. So this really just feels like an extension of that. We don't know if these smart new pucks will uh, come with any sort of goal line technology to help the league and referees with video reviews, but given the recent controversies, that has to be somewhere down the road. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of about time mm-hmm. when you think about it. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess it would be interesting if they started testing it during a playoff because I feel like that would just be really bad. Um, yeah, I think that's a bad time ju- to start. And they should just wait until the next season. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, I mean, what sucks is that we have to go through, I guess, what, one more season without this type of technology? Yeah. Um, but hey, I mean, I guess we've gone through what almost a century worth. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, I guess w- one more is not going to be <laughs> uh, t- is not going to be too bad. Mm-hmm. I also think it'll be a huge waste if they don't actually release this with goal time goal line technology in it immediately. Because uh, I don't know. What's I feel the like they're point? one and the same though. Well, they're not. They just want to track the puck. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, if it if it works though, then maybe it'll lead in like the following year. Who knows? Maybe. Hopefully. Yeah. All right. And now we have some World Cup news. As many of you know, Fox Sports paid almost half a billion dollars for the broadcasting rights of the 2018 and 2022 FIFA World Cups. And despite the U.S. being eliminated in the qualifiers by Trinidad and Tobago in October, the network is still going all in on the tournament. So the 2018 World Cup is in Russia, and Fox will broadcast from a special studio in Red Square in Moscow. And it'll also be using four fully robotic cameras for the specific use of augmented reality graphics during their broadcasts. It'll also have two behind-the-goal camera cranes, two cameras in the goal, two cameras on the goal line, as well as a camera in a helicopter for every game. So the system that's set up can reportedly handle sending 25 terabytes of data from Moscow to L.A. every day for editing purposes. So brace yourselves for a lot of soccer in just a couple weeks. Yeah, I mean, what what, what interests me most is we're going to have to, it's going to be, and this is something that can be looked into, uh, to see how they are using all of that data because that's so much data a lot. where are they storing it uh who is storing it for them mm-hmm. uh and all that sort of stuff because i think that's uh that's a pretty interesting story to tell for some sort of uh storage uh provider mm-hmm. because that's a whole lot of data 25 terabytes a day, a day. The, the world yeah. cup is a long long event so um the actual act of getting it from moscow to la is not that impressive i guess but like where is it all going and how is it all going to be used that's going to be cool mm-hmm. yes we'll definitely follow up for everyone And next, a new two-story soccer training center has opened up in Vancouver that boasts some pretty cool new technology. So the facility is called the Urban Soccer Center and was started by three former professional soccer players, Alexander Elliott, Michael D'Agostino, and Rob Friend, who have all played on Canada's national team in the MLS and in Europe. So the first level of the center will have a lounge and a small field for three-on-three games, but the upstairs portion of it will have a larger field that will be equipped with TACA, a technology training system that uses machines to fire soccer balls onto the field, just like a pitching machine in baseball or a tennis ball machine would in tennis. So coaches can control the speed, direction, and trajectory of the balls and incorporate any kind of goal, obstacle, movement, and even special lighting and sound into the drills to make them more realistic. 
The three founders are hoping that this fast-paced environment will improve players' skills and even get them to the highest levels of soccer in Canada and maybe throughout the world. The space isn't just for professionals or up-and-coming stars, however. It's also open to the public as well, and it can host community events. So if you're in Vancouver, you should go check it out. Yeah, I I like that this could potentially help with Canadian soccer because mm-hmm. it's non-existent. Because we need it. Yeah, Absolutely. could it be cool to see Canada in the World Cup? And uh, and I'll by let me rephrase in men's soccer, uh, women's soccer, we're the best. Yes, so, absolutely. Well, uh, we have one no, of the best. We have no problem. No, we are the best. We have no problem there. <laughs> so we just uh, need for men. Thank you. All right. And now the Women's Tennis Association has teamed up with the U.S. wearables company called Massimo for athlete health monitoring technology. So the WTA will be using Massimo's MiteSat system at their tournaments, which uses a fingertip oximeter (laughs) designed for general wellness and health to improve non-invasive patient measurements like oxygen saturation and pulse rate and display this information in real time. So users are able to track their data through an app. And the WTA's Vice President of Sports Sciences and Medicine, Kathleen Stroya, says that they've made this move to help assess their players' health and give them better options for servicing their health needs. I mean, what's awesome is we talk so much about how uh, the medical field is going to benefit so much from all of this technology. And this mm-hmm. is just another example. Athletes are going to have more access to, to, to technology. It's going to be more readily available. And it's going to be stuff like this that can really help with their health. Um, and it's non-invasive and it's hopefully affordable and that's cool and it's faster too right like Mm -hmm. it gives you results much quicker you can tackle problems in your health much faster it's a great great idea exactly all right next streaming service DAZN has won the canadian tv rights for european soccer so under the deal DAZN will have the rights to every single game in both the champions league and the europa league for three years starting with this season's 2018-2019 club championship season so traditionally these games have been shown on tsn in canada but DAZN is apparently uh, has no plans to license out any of its new rights uh, so DAZN is the only place that you can probably watch it next year going forward. Uh, it's available as a monthly subscription or a yearly subscription and also boasts games from the NFL, the MLB, MLS, uh, and many other sports like crickets, esports, all that sort of stuff. I guess I'm still pretty down on DAZN. Yeah, but they have done a lot to improve sure. their service. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, well, I just hope, I mean... I guess considering they keep getting these rights, Mm -hmm. let's hope they keep improving. Yes, exactly. All right, next and more streaming news. YouTube has gained exclusive rights to stream Brazil's top soccer league, Brasileiro. And this makes Brasileiro the only major domestic soccer division to be shown live on YouTube. The rights package means YouTube can broadcast 110 live matches, as well as highlights from all the games played. So unfortunately, it doesn't sound like us in North America will have access to these streams, but most of Europe and Asia will get coverage. So if you live there, you can check out Brazil soccer. Yeah, no, it's cool. Um, it just shows, I mean, we've, I've talked about it before, uh, when all these major broadcast rights go up, Watch out for YouTube and stuff like yeah. that. Because, uh, I mean, I guess Google. <laughs> but, True. Uh, all these big uh, tech giants are really going to try and go after it. And so ESPN and all those companies are going to have to look out. Absolutely. Okay. And then last but not least, SAP has teamed up with Mercedes-Benz to become its official business performance partner during the 2019 season of the Formula E racing circuit. So this is the electric powered vehicle branch of the Formula One racing. Uh, And as part of this deal, SAP will be providing its business data platform, HANA, to develop better tech solutions to help the team analyze large volumes of data and monitor overall performance. Mercedes will also be using SAP's cloud platform for all their data, its artificial intelligence powered technologies, and even some IoT devices. So they got a high tech boost there. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, going to be super important for, uh, uh, especially in Formula E racing, because there's so much data that comes in and on so many different parts of the vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see. Like, like this is going to be necessary uh, in the future for all these, uh, uh, you know, competition racing uh, type sports. So it'll be uh, it'll be cool to see how Mercedes benefits from it. Absolutely. All right. Well, that was it for our news portion of today. Now we are going to move on to our new apps and wearables segments. 
Yeah, so not a lot g- going on this week. So uh, just first up, British tennis sensation and superstar Andy Murray is investing in a UK tech startup with his 77 sports management organization that is creating a mobile app that, according to Forbes, claims that it can do for playing tennis what Uber has done for taxis and Airbnb has done for accommodation. So basically, the app, which is called Deuce, helps tennis players find courts and coaching sessions around the UK in a more affordable fashion than just joining a tennis club. And at the same time, uh, those tennis clubs still get part of the profits. So Murray is getting involved because he views it as a good way to get people involved with the sport, which has been growing, which has been a growing concern throughout his career despite his popularity. Uh, by making it easier to get involved with tennis and the tennis community with Deuce, he aims to help fill empty courts. And so currently Deuce is in its trial phase in the St. Albans area of the UK, or of London specifically, with plans to launch in London this summer. At least I think that's in London. I hope it is. Uh, <laughs> probably around Wimbledon, I imagine. Uh, from there, it would branch out to the rest of the UK later in the year, starting and then starting in July, a £10 a month premium service will launch as well, which allows users to book one court a day and join one session a week. And that is so affordable. If anyone knows mm. anything about tennis like club prices, that is the most affordable tennis I've ever seen. Yeah, so that's, a good um, idea. that's cool. I hope it comes to Toronto. I would use it all the time. Mm-hmm. So I just I, I think it's a fantastic idea. My only issue with it is the name. I mean, it's a tennis name. I know. I I know that has tennis ramifications, and but it also makes you think of something else. I mean, yeah, but it's like if it's a tennis app, you would see it and be like, "That's tennis. That's not anything else." Yeah, but if you stumble upon it in another. <laughs> Yeah, section. okay. I, I mean, I, whatever. It, it's just me being stupid, but yeah, that's what it makes <laughs> me think of, and it makes me kind of giggle like a 14-year-old. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, and just uh, one more story. Uh, so a- an Amsterdam-based fitness app company called Virtua Gym has just raised another $7 million in its second round of funding. So Virtua Gym offers two apps, a consumer-centric app with a database of more than 40, of uh, not 40,000, just 4,000 workouts. 40,000 would be a lot, including 3D animations and written instructions, and a professional app for gyms, health clubs, and uh, personal trainers. There's also Virtua Gym, a food app that includes uh, calorie, carb, and fat counters, and the apps can share data between them as well as connect to Fitbits. So with this funding, Virtua Gym plans to promote international expansion in Europe and the Americas and create new tools for things like yoga studios, martial arts dojos, and dance studios. So I just bring this up because uh, we talk a lot about in the future of these markets and how uh, people are investing in it and this is just another example of how wearables apps they're all going to continue to grow people believe in it people are investing in it so uh, they're not going anywhere ever so uh, mm-hmm. keep an eye out because this might be something that you or your company is looking into yeah and the more they integrate with other companies the better right like this can connect to fitbit i think that's a great move they yeah. should all be interconnected yeah i think that's how all these things will will help like especially with apple and all that but that mm-hmm. requires apple to play ball first so this we'll see is true <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for our new apps and wearables segment. Now we're going to move on to our concussion updates. Yes. So every day, a large portion of athletes with a history of repetitive head trauma are battling with a progressive neurodegenerative brain disease called CTE. Symptoms of CTE include blurred vision, dementia, depression, headaches, memory loss, and mood swings. There is no cure, and it only gets worse with time. This is the number one issue in sports, so every week we'll be updating you on what is happening in the world of concussion prevention. Uh, so just like last week, we only have two stories. Uh, first up, a, stor- a story out of New Jersey about how the state continues to lead all other states in concussion awareness and safeguards from the press of Atlantic City. So the article talks about how Shore Medical Center in Somers Point, New Jersey, led another educational demonstration that taught parents the warning signs of a brain injury in hockey. So this involved demonstrating the benefits of pre-injury baseline tests for athletes that can help with the recovery process as well. So events like these aren't run by the state, but going back to 2010, the state of New Jersey has been looking at concussions. So in 2010, NJ adopted a law that required school districts to have uh, policies addressing concussions in student athletes. And in 2012, all high school physicians, coaches, and trainers were all receiving concussion training. Then in 2017, Governor Chris Christie made the third Thursday of September Concussion Awareness Day, and most recently, (laughs) there's been a lot, a bill has been sponsored in the state that if passed would require school districts to adopt a multi-step process before athletes with concussions could return. So it's a pretty in-depth bill that would first require students to return to normal school activities free of symptoms, and then there's a five-step return process that would require the student athlete to first participate in light uh, light aerobics, then moderate activity, then heavy non-contact activity, then full contact practices and then finally return to the competition so i love this i think this is such an important move by the city of new jersey and it's a real shame that all of these laws whether it be in canada or the u.s seem to just be at state or provincial levels so far i'd love to see them go uh like any federal laws whether 
it's in Canada or the U.S. about this, but I think that if stuff like this passes and then is successful, uh, we're just getting one step closer to that becoming a reality. Yeah, this is awesome. I love the step by step, the the five step return process. Like that's great, and I think that should be implemented federally. Like you said, that that's a great first step into you know having mandatory concussion protocol in all sports and leagues and whatnot. Also, shout out to Chris Christie. <laughs> Yeah. I wasn't expecting uh, him to be into this, but hey. I mean, he does uh, uh, one okay every like thing, every like ten things. Yeah, I mean, if this is his good thing, concussion awareness, you know, we'll take it. Yes, That's uh, important. And welcome to our podcast within a podcast, uh, politics. Yes, we love this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, for the second story, uh, speaking of baselines. Uh, This comes from the Bangor Daily News in Maine. So students in Maine at the Maine Concussion Management Initiative based in Colby College in Waterville have created the software that allows athletes to play a 30 to 45 minute video game that is called the Impact Test. And it measures memory, reaction time, speed, and concentration. So this would then act as a baseline for the athletes, which becomes important to the recovery process after suffering a concussion. For instance, an athlete in the recovery process could take this test and then compare the results with the baseline that they had at the beginning of the season, for instance, to determine determine where in the recovery process that they are. So what's cool with this data, uh, this data is that it's actually being uh, uh, used by concussion research, uh, researchers, and it's even doing its part with awareness, because just by going through the act of the test at the beginning of each season, it helps raise awareness about concussions with athletes, parents, and coaches, which is super important in high schools and all that, because you usually need to get your parents' approval uh, when you're in high school. So if they're like, oh, hey, what's this test you're taking? It's like uh, it's like for concussions. Just awesome. Just a cool conversation that, that it's uh, happening. So I just like it as a cool example of how there isn't going to be one fix for concussions um that's just not possible with how complicated the brain is but all these tests and awareness programs that are going a a long way with helping recovery and then hopefully we can develop some prevention tech as well but like we see all these tiny states whether it's ontario pei in canada or uh, maine or in new jersey whatever we're seeing all of these tiny things happening uh at provincial and state levels and hopefully they move to federal hopefully you know they move to some of the professional leagues um i will i I guess this baseline type stuff is already in the professional leagues (laughs) (laughs) true Um, no i think all of this will snowball yeah but it's not just a professional athlete problem Mm -hmm. it's a student athlete problem it's a everyone problem so this is a really awesome thing well this actually might be one of my favorite concussion stories ever because I, I feel like this is a great idea and I, I've been trying to say this for so long. Like when, when you're in high school and, and you get chosen for the varsity team of whatever sport, you should have to do this test before playing or practicing at all. You know, like this should be the one thing that you have to do going into the league season. Uh, you need the baseline and then you can base on concussions from that. I don't know. Yeah, no, I just, I completely agree. Um, and I think what could be interesting, too, is just because we t- we've talked about how concussions aren't just an athlete problem as well at some point. It could be cool if when you go to take a physical at your just family doctor, mm-hmm. if a test like this, maybe not a 30 to 45 minute one, um, is included. That would be really cool. Like yeah. where that's just then part of your baseline and that's part of your physical because that's an important part. You should know if you have a concussion because you hit yeah. your head. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so that's it for a concussion update. Um, now we're going to move on to our discussion portion. And our discussion today stems from a controversial news story that's come out this week. Apparently, the Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority, or ACIDA, is using smartphone hacking technology to help its investigations into doping allegations in sports. So the organization has paid almost $13,000 for a 12-month license of a universal forensic extraction device, um, which is software made by Celebrite, which is an Israeli company. And they call it, or they describe the technology um, as being something that can easily bypass patterns or pin locks and overcome encryption challenges to extract data like text messages or images from a device. So ACIDA says that they're following all the rules to regulate this type of activity, but it's obviously stirred up a lot of uh, criticism about the potential misuse of technology uh, because these types of tools typically require a warrant to use uh, and whether any of this powerful technology is really necessary. So we wanted to discuss it in a little bit more depth. Um, we all have some thoughts about it. Alex, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, uh, right away, I kind of really dial in on the warrant aspect of it because if they actually go to a judge and get a warrant, I think it's fine. Right. Because if, if you can prove to a judge that it's necessary, 
uh, and it just makes and it's true and it makes the sport better than sure. But if you don't need a warrant, and then it's just too easy to abuse. That's the problem. It's mm-hmm. like yeah, you people should not be doping in sports, but like it's too easy to like it's just like you're you're gonna just it's gonna cause so many problems. Keep the warrant aspect. I think it's fine. Right, but I think with this technology, it's saying that they wouldn't need to get warrants for this because yeah. they would have the license for this technology for 12 months. Um, and Celebrate also is the Israeli company who actually hacked the iPhone of the San Bernardino shooter last year after Apple refused to cooperate with the FBI. So they have a bit of an intense history. And it sounds like they're really good at their job and they're really good at what they've been saying they can do. So if they don't actually need a warrant now to use this on athletes in Australia, that... I mean, that causes a lot of privacy and security concerns. Yeah, I, and that's the problem. Like, if you keep the warrant aspect, mm-hmm. and I'm going to dial in on it again, because I think that's the one barrier right. that would prevent uh, abuse, or it probably not prevent it, but at least, like, maybe slow, st- it, down. slow it down or, like, <laughs> stop, like, 95% of it or yeah. something like that. Um, but otherwise, it's just, I mean, like, it's just an ethical thing. Right. Like hacking athletes, texts, and I mean, what else do you have on your phone? Like all these subscription-based apps now, Mm -hmm. they'd be able to access any of that data. If you have a Fitbit that's connected to your phone, they'd be able to access that with this technology too. Like they'd be able to get so much, like our phones are not just phones anymore. They're like little mini computers. Yeah. I mean, like so much of your life is on that. And it's just like, it's like, I mean, you got to remember too, athletes, it's their job. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not like their entire life and revolves around you know their their being an athlete i mean like it does Mm -hmm. but they have other it's called a work-life balance um (laughs) even (laughs) athletes have those too even athletes have that as well (laughs) and so like it's just i don't i don't like that this idea of giving an organization a government agency no less um the ability to just like blanket hack any athlete in australia um and i i don't think something like that would happen in north america or canada i wouldn't put it past like the trump administration again welcome to our podcast within a podcast politics <laughs> politics <woo>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but, but uh i think it's just bad right like i just feel like this is kind of going down like a really weird slippery slope like i I didn't have time to google this but i don't think any other sports organizations have this authority in 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 our democratic world no one else has this now except for the australian sports anti-doping authority Mm -hmm. and this is the same technology being used by the fbi for like terrorism attacks like to me that just seems a little extreme like i know and doping is bad and we don't want drugs and sports also not terrorism no, it's not terrorism. And like the whole it's Russia. It's not even like comparable to terrorism. <laughs> no. And the whole Russia controversy at the Olympics, like that's a big deal for sure. But it's still sports. You know, like, like you mm-hmm. said, like this is not terrorism. It's just people drugging themselves to do better in sports. Like that's not the end of the world. I don't think you need this type of extreme technology to cut back on that. I, I'm 100% with you. Yeah. And like, even if you try and look at it the other way. It's that thing where it's just like you're bringing like a machine gun to like a knife fight type thing. Yeah. It's like it's not that big. Like, again, doping's bad. It shouldn't happen. Yes. <laughs> but like you can't like it's it's so like vital and so like uh, necessary to happen right away that you can't go to a judge and get a warrant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's proportionate like, <laughs> yeah. like representation here. Yeah. Proportionate retaliation. Yeah. It makes it makes no sense. I what's going to be really interesting to see how it's actually used um and how often it's used like if if it's is it this thing that like just like goes by the wayside and then we don't hear about it for like five years until it's actually relevant Mm -hmm. who knows right so uh this could just be overreactions on our part at the beginning too who knows um that's true but i still think it's a terrible idea right like it is just starting now and it's only for 12 months so hopefully we'll get more news stories of how they're using this and how effective it is uh within the next year and we'll report back yeah i'm not uh, very optimistic no i'm not either <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's it for today's episode thanks to everyone who listened this is episode 45 um and just a reminder that we're actually now in a daily format as well if you'd rather listen to us that way you can follow us on twitter at itb tech and sports or our personal accounts at mandy v kovacs and alex t radu and alex actually has some sad news for us yeah this is my last episode i know this is my last day at the it world canada's uh so yeah <laughs> I know it's very sad. It is. It is very sad. Uh, this podcast will continue. Yes, it will continue. Uh, we're actually bringing in another Alex, 
Um, <laughs> that was the requirement that I had. Uh, was that <laughs> uh, you can only replace me with another Alex? Yeah, it has to be so, someone with the same name. Someone with the same name, uh, not the same last name, which would which would have been just weird, I guess. That would have been kind of cool. <laughs> that would have been really cool. <laughs> Alex Radu is actually more popular than you would know. Um, <laughs> like it's a very common name, uh, so it wouldn't be impossible, but not very likely. Um, but yeah, no. Beyond so, our resources, anyways. Uh, beyond exactly beyond our <laughs> our menial resources um so yeah no it's been uh, awesome and uh i mean stay tuned follow me on uh on twitter alex t radu i will have uh some news in yes. the coming weeks yes so we'll definitely uh, be hearing more about him yeah i i'm not just going to disappear into the darkness no or maybe i will who knows yeah who knows but we'll definitely hear more about him you, and you need a little mystery in your life <laughs> <laughs> and we'll meet alex coop next week so everyone stay tuned yep thanks for All watching right. or yeah. listening not thanks watching. for listening everyone <laughs> <laughs>